In this video, you're going to see Plucky and Margarita from Sailing into Freedom. I did this interview about a year ago, and I'm a, just a big fan of Sailing into Freedom. And I think he had a lot of interesting things to say. He also talks about, about what happened with the loss of his catamaran, uh, which was wrecked on a reef in the remote parts of Australia. Subscribe to the Slow Boat Sailing channel, where we give you the stories of the most interesting sailors in the world. Enjoy this interview. It is a treat. Episodes about, you know, the self-sufficiency that you were trying to achieve that you were trying to catch all your own food and be off the grid. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Well, that was, that was, um, when I was at uni, we had, um, I don't know, you know this, but, um, you have a very large gap, um, a large lot of holidays. And generally when I was at uni, I didn't have any money. So I used to get dropped off on these little islands. And um, 400 bucks I used to live for three months. I just take a couple of spear guns, a tarp, and uh, maybe a tent and a sleeping bag, and I'd just go. And so I'd just live like that for a few months, and uh, I'd come back. So I always liked doing that sort of stuff. Um, I still want to do that sort of stuff. Um, it sort of went by the wayside a little bit because uh, I think the blog tended to focus more on the crew after a while and people wanted to know more about the crew and so we sort of uh, edited the videos to show more of the crew and less sort of the self-sufficiency because it seemed that um, hardly anyone was interested in it <laughs> and, and because my funds was uh, it's always in the toilet um, we had to sort of go we had to compromise a little bit and show what people wanted to see because I I, I know of only about uh, maybe six people that actually are interested in the self sufficiency that I know of <laughs> okay. that are watching my podcast. Okay. So maybe I'm uh, seven, I guess. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe yeah, maybe you're the seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, but you, you still do a lot of uh, fishing and, and uh, hunting your own food, and you don't you don't buy a lot in grocery stores, right? Or no, we try to lots of just yeah. just vegetables and the can the can beans and chickpeas, and that's it. If we don't catch the fish until the end of the day, we just have veggies, and that's and, our and diet. Yeah. yeah, but if we're on a reef, that never happens. We'll always get food. There's no, never, well, unless it's unbelievably bad weather, uh, we'll get food. Or no fishing zones, like it happened. Oh, yeah, well. Now, yeah, we, at least we were screwed, no fishing. Yeah, that's true. We had to be stuck with chicken salads and bean salads. Yeah, there's no, there's no fishing really allowed in Belize, so uh, it's a bit of a bugger. So... You know, one of the introductory things I normally ask people is, uh, please state your names and the name of your boat. Okay. Well, I'm Plucky, and the new boat is called Freedom. And I'm Margarita. All right. And do you ever go by, like, your any name besides Plucky, or you always want to be called Plucky? Well, it's easier. I, I don't really like the name Peter myself. Um, I mean, I mean, you know the the saying to peter out. Yeah. It's to fade away. It's a bit like my blog, really. Fade away. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of people called Peter, so it's good to have a more identifiable name. I think. I um, I think you know when I was watching some of your early episodes, it was um. Uh, you you kind of went into why you're called Plucky. I thought that you you had a very difficult divorce. Is that is that that was kind of where your your vlog started? Is that right? A difficult divorce? No, divorce. Divorce. Oh, a difficult divorce. Oh. <laughs> if that's okay to talk about it, you mentioned no, it in your vlog. Um, not like that at all. Um, Plucky. Um, we 
if you look it up in the dictionary, it actually means courageous, but that's not where it comes from at all. Uh, Peter Larkersky, and there's a lot of L's and K's in my last name, okay. and a U, <laughs> so it's lucky. Okay, I get it. I think to be known as being courageous, but unfortunately not. It's just from my name. Okay. All right. Uh, so you used to have uh, a catamaran. What kind of catamaran did you have? It was a Crowther 42216A. As far as I knew, there was only three ever built. Okay. And so that's uh, like a 42-foot catamaran, something like that? Yeah, 42, yeah. And what kind of gear did you have on that catamaran? Was it pretty stripped down, or was it uh, was it all pimped out? When I first got it, it had ovens and two air conditioning units, a hot water system. It had a microwave. It had a fridge. It freezer. had a freezer. It had... Uh, there were fancy other things. cupboards. Nice. Yeah, fancy cupboards. It had fancy woodwork and fancy doors that were all heavy. Um, I gave away or the air conditioning. I had a, a bimini structure. I gave away the bimini. I gave away the air conditioning. I took out the fridge freezer. I took out the hot water. I gave that away. The microwave uh, I gave away. Uh, I stripped it down to... The stove and uh, Well, it wasn't really a stove. It was that, that tiny metal, uh, tiny pan of steel... Uh, meth, uh, metho stove and I think in the States they call it a denatured alcohol stove it's a very very slow cooking stove it's a standalone unit it's got a little you know a little reservoir at the top and you fill it up uh, and you and some of them you pump it this one was just um, uh, through heat transfer it was all we had oh I had a smoker like a fish smoker so I stripped it down to the bare bones because uh, I wanted the boat lighter and also I wanted to make it um, simple. So I didn't want to have, you know, um, I mean, I've seen a lot of cruisers. Um, they rock up to a place and you don't even see them leave the boat. From like one, one boat I saw come into one um, anchorage, I didn't see them for a week. They didn't leave their, their boat for a week. And I found out they were eating ice cream because they had a bit of a passage and they were watching movies and drinking. Uh, I don't want that type of cruising. I want to, um, as soon as I get there, I have to immediately start looking right. I need dinner for the night. Uh, let's go over there or let's check out that or let's do something. And in that way, it keeps you fit because you always have to be going out and doing stuff. Whereas if I've got, a, you know, 10 kilos of meat in my fridge freezer and I've got ice cream and chips and whatever. I don't have to do anything. I can just sit there and watch movies just like these other boats do. Some other boats, some, are, some aren't like that. But I was amazed. I mean, how much fun can you have in a boat eating ice cream and chips and drinking to your heart's content for a week? Yeah, no, it's not, that's not my type of cruising. It's, yeah, I don't like that sort of thing. But, well... Horses for courses. Awesome. I, I, yeah, I think that the whole self-sufficiency, I think that you like a, a much more stripped-down boat than uh, I think is typical, right? That you, yeah. you're you not you're not looking for the luxuries. You're looking for the uh, uh, just the minimalist experience. Um, but you have stuff like chart plotters. Did you have, like, do you have, like, satellite phones or what, what kind of other gear do you have on your boat? Uh -huh. Yes. I mean, yeah, we did, we have we a chart plotter. Have chart uh, we don't have to have a chart plotter. Uh, I inherited on Long Reef a HF radio that didn't quite work properly. Uh, we never had a sat phone. Um, you got to understand also that um, I did have a very nice boat. Long Reef was a very nice boat, and I put a lot of money into the boat, and um, there was no money left over to do cruising. Um, so, um, I was sort of stuck. I mean, originally people would say, oh, why did you have such a big boat in the first place? Well, it was to take my family 
uh, and go visit some wonderful places. But um, they didn't want to go in the end, so um, I was left with the boat. And I had to <laughs> make the best of the situation. Uh, so I tried to minimise everything, minimise the costs, and I've always had this dream of going around and, and, and visiting all these places. So I had to, I had to go. Um, yeah, so that's how I ended up with the boat. So to some people, uh, I, I've seen some criticism. They say, "Oh, you, you got this flash boat." It was that. Well, I had to have, uh, I had to have a catamaran number one to get my partner to go on the boat. Uh, you'll find that a lot of girls, to get girls on a boat, it has to be a catamaran. <laughs> there are very few monohull girls. Uh, I have met some. Uh, Margarita's one. Uh, but there's not many. Uh, there's a greater proportion of catamaran girls. So it had to be a catamaran. It had to be, had to be big enough to have a family on it. So that's why I had the catamaran. But then I had the rug pulled out from under me and... Voila, that was the situation. So I tried to make the best um, of that situation. What was the, the name of the catamaran again? Long Reef. Long Reef. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so you kind of had this too big a boat for just you, but you thought you were going to have more people on the boat, but you, it, it didn't end up that way. When did you make the decision to quit your job and live full-time on the boat and cruise? Uh, when? Yeah. Uh, I think that was, what, three years ago. Um, look, I, I sh to tell you the truth, I should have done it 30 years ago. I should have... Are we good? We're just checking the battery. Oh, sorry, we're just checking the battery. Yeah, yeah, we're good. My, my phone's a dud. Um... Uh, so the question was, uh, when? Okay, so three years ago, look, I bought Long Reef uh, eight or nine years ago, and I sp spent an immense amount of time making it simple and homely for me and, and the family. And then, and, um, I think three years ago, I decided to leave. Um, it was hard to do it because I, I was working at the time, but... You know how I think people get caught up in working and they got that security and then it's hard for them to make the break and it was hard for me. I should have done it years ago. Uh, I mean, I would have been in a, uh, a difficult spot, but, you know, shit works out. And if not, you just got to make it work out. So uh, I should have done it years ago. I, I look, honestly, if there are people watching, uh, don't think about it. And don't do it. Do it now. Just do it now. Don't wait. Don't prepare too much. Just do it now. Because you'll find you'll get in a comfortable situation and you'll be doing it later and later and later. And then if you get a bit too old, you'll get scared. When you get scared, then you don't want to do it anymore. So it's better to do the difficult stuff when you're a bit younger um, because you're better able to deal with it, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did that answer the question? That did. That was a really great answer. Uh, could you tell me, so did I hear that you were a lawyer before you uh, quit your job? I was, a be I was the world's, I'm the world's worst blogger, by the way, and I'm the world's worst lawyer as well. There you go. Okay. Are there two couples? All right. Um, so where did you go cruising in Long Reef? Where? Yeah. Basically, east coast of Australia and all the way across the top into past Darwin into the Kimberleys where the voyage was terminated. Prematurely. Okay. Maybe you could tell uh, tell us about uh, what, what happened uh, when you lost Long Reef. What happened? Yeah. At, at the time or after? Uh, at, it's how did how did it happen that you hit the reef and or the rock and and? Oh, well, we just did an episode on that. Um, I don't know. Is that did that prompt your your message today? That last video. No, I've seen I've seen I saw your pre episodes, but I'm interested in the wreck. I'm interested in what happened after. I'm interested in the fact that you bought a new boat. So I'm interested in all that. 
Okay, well, um, uh, well, it's in the video, basically. We'll, we'll put a link to that video in the show notes. Yeah. Well, essentially, it's hard to... You know how you have certain rules when you're sailing? And normally I've been very, very careful. Um, I mean, I've had people... Um, when we've left anchorages in the middle of the night, they said to me, Clucky, come with me. I know a shortcut through the reef. I've been there before. I've got my track. I just follow my track. And I just go, no, I don't care. I'll do that extra five mile. I'll do that extra 10 mile. I'm not going to follow you in a shortcut because it's just too dangerous to follow a track, especially at night. And I have these rules, and everyone should have these rules. Eyeball navigation is primary. But for some reason, that day, it's like these little decisions or little situations that for some reason negate that primary rule. And I don't, like we were using fuel. We were low on fuel. And the Kimberleys, if you know, if you don't know about it, it's, it's just nothing there. It's the most remote region in Australia. And we were low on fuel. And we I had don't to even be... have um, telephone services. You have to have a satellite phone if you want to communicate with someone. And even Gonzo, um, other people that have had satellite phones there, have only been able to use text because they couldn't actually have a phone call. Anyway, so we're in a very remote area. We were low on fuel. And that's primary in my mind. I'm conserving fuel. And I remember leaving this anchorage very early in the morning to get the bit of the lambreeks to maximise the distance we could get to the next anchorage. And I had black backup plans and everything. And I studied the weather, I studied the, 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 um, the tides, and I thought I had it all right. And then for some, we sailed a little bit that day, and then the wind died, and it hadn't done that for a week. Because I've been watching, I've been going, okay, we leave there, and I had it all worked out. And then for some reason, when it should have been building, it just died. And I'm going, and I'm looking at the sky and I'm thinking, there was an island there. I was thinking, is there a massive thermal air that's blocking the breeze? What am I doing? Should I wait a bit? And so I waited for an hour and that, that killed us in, in, a, in half part um, because I had to do this channel and this channel is a very, very strong current and you want it in your favour because as soon as it turns... Um, we ended up doing one knot or one knot, one and a half knots when it did turn and we didn't get through it in time and it was all thrown out by that weather thing. But the bad mistake from there uh, the, at, at that instance was as soon as the plan was not met with the wind coming in at the time, I should have gone, right, back up plan one and, and that was it and made that decision. It's just that it was really early in the day still and I thought, we've got plenty of time. I'll keep on going, and I shouldn't have done that. Why else do you have the backup plans to, to to follow them? And I didn't follow. That, point, that was already spent that so mistake much fuel. led to the accident because I should have gone straight to that backup anchorage. So you uh -huh. you were kind of delayed, and you went into the channel at night, and you couldn't see. No, no, no. This was this was still during the day. But the mistake, this, the mistake made was not. What he's not understanding was we already made some part of the way yeah. and we had spent fuel and time. And we and spent the fuel. That's we still have lights to get to our destination. We had plenty of light. Plenty of light, but then the wind really died and we had to turn on the engines. So. And that's when you start that the rules are not so hard and fast. You think, well, look, I just expect for some reason when you're making way it's difficult for sailors or anyone to back go back to turn and back. i spent the fuel two and two and a half hours in fuel trying to get through this thing and i'm and you think well i just wasted two and a half hours of fuel i, I want some net oh I, I want some uh As result we, from this and it would be probably max one hour and a half two to get to the destination didn't like that. Yeah, we got caught in the channel, the, the the current reversed, and we were right at the end of the channel, and that last few miles, a couple of miles, took us forever to get through. And it was all built upon our original mistake. We should have just gone back to the backup plan. And so 
it took us ages to get through the channel because we missed the last bit of the current or the current turn. And then when we got into the bay, which I still thought we had plenty of time, we had a two and a half knot current against us there. And it was this huge bay, huge. And I just, I'm just dumbfounded. And then what I should have done then as I should have just gone and backtracked because we had plenty of time and used the current that was against us in the channel to go on back to our original backup plan, which would have been, what, still 12 mile back. Um, but at least we would have been safe. But I didn't because I'd expanded the fuel. And Basically, it was... You get driven by your destination, was, unfortunately, and it, it clouds everything. It's, it's, I think it was sunset and it was still one hour or one hour and a half to get to our anchorage yeah. point where we're sure we're going to be safe to spend the night. So it was sunset and then it was completely dark. We didn't have moon. And we were, what, like 100, 300 meters? How far we were from oh, we the coastline? We were a long way, we from, were a long the way from the shoal area. And here's another thing. I, that you, again, you change your rules. The eyeball navigation the primary thing, right? But I had I had waypoints to follow. I had Google Maps. I could see the shoal the areas. Images. We had it all. And so you think, well, yeah, I don't have eyeball navigation. We just got caught out. Mind you, I put myself in the situation to get caught out. We it's felt not... comfortable because we have yeah, all, these, that's right. all these tools to and use. Then, and then we we're well away from the reefs. Yeah. And then um, it was out of the sun and you just feel... Yeah, that's right. Ah. That's right. And then we hit the race. Yeah. Because it was night time. Because, yes, we weren't it relying was, on it our was eyes. Just, it was 33 metres of water for... Yeah, for we're, we're in 30 metres of water. Sitting pretty, middle of the thing. Yikes. And, 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 then, on reef. and then, bang, reef. Wow. And... And the interesting thing is, we were looking. What did we go see? The guy dog on cat. Oh, yeah, we, we found two someone... people that knew of that the uncharted rock. And they have sent it to already to Garmin, Avionics, to everyone. Well, they and sent they... it to the, the chartographers. Yeah, and they haven't updated they yet. Haven't so they haven't updated. It's known it. by people, yeah. sailors. They've been sailing that area for some time. And the thing is. People that may have done exactly the same route as us, because it's so big tight in the Kimberleys, it, it can go to 12 meters tight. So they may have passed the same way, and they were not, they haven't hit the reef because it was high tide. We were right going and was getting low tide, so we got caught, and then we were stay stuck there, and we had to wait a bit to the tide to race. Yeah. So we were then ripped off and ripped the rest of the holes and then it's when the water started coming really thick. Ah, so so when you were when the water was coming in it wasn't like you were sitting on the rock that you were actually floating, right? That you we you well, no. sitting on the rock but we have waves smashing the boat all around. That's right. The boat the boat hit the reef and then the waves were coming and they were rocking the boat and they chewed up the holes. Just chewed up the holes. It was slowly Imagine this is the rock we were sitting here, mm -hmm. and slowly it was in. And then, and, were yeah. loose, and, then right? it, and then it shook us free, and that's when it shook us free. Um, well, we had major damage to the holes before that, um, but because we were supported somewhat, the ingress of the water was less. But then, when the last wave pushed us free, it tore all the motors. And the, and the rudders, rudders, and then it was just catastrophic. Then it was, it was just a floating vessel with no steering. No steering, but massive And heavy, holes. heavy stuff. Massive just floating. What I think is amazing, and that's kind of instructive, I think, about catamarans, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's still floated with big holes in the boat, right? You wouldn't get that in a mono hull. You would have just sunk to the bottom and would have had to abandon ship. Yeah, yeah. We had both holes with water almost until the top. If one of the footage you can see, Peter has water until his neck on both holes. Mm -hmm. But then if you come to the lounge, the water is until our our knees. Yeah. Well, that's the bridge. So. Yeah, the bridge. Yeah, a caravan ought to float. 
unless it's broke into the middle, so no, it breaches in the middle. Yeah, but then it can sink the other one. No, it's just flat with two sides, yeah. it's two halves. And uh, you, you mentioned the tides are very big in the Kimberleys, so I guess the currents are also very big. What what was like the fastest current that you experienced there? Um, well, we actually hadn't got to the fastest. There's some, I couldn't tell you because I wasn't there, but there are some really strong currents. It's like a waterfall that's horizontal. It's like stream. But we had four knots. Um in a place called Scott's Passage. That's the one that caught us out. Um, the other thing I should say is, yes, um, we lost an hour when the wind died and I was waiting because I, I didn't want to use any fuel. But the other thing that happened there, it's difficult to read your tides, your high tides and low tides. And the previous bay, I anchored near a rock and I was watching where it was high tide and low tide. So I knew spot on when it was high tide and low tide. But you go round into another sound, another bay, they're different. They're, they're slightly out. And I reckon it was out by another hour or an hour and a half. And that was the other thing, the other hour and a half that caught us. So ultimately, ultimately I was two and a half hours out, I think, for trying to make that passage to get the current in favour of us. So that's what screwed us. So... Uh, the Kimberleys is a pretty remote region, is is that right? Not right. many people that live there. Uh, no. no, you don't have there's people. No, there's, no, there's, no one, there. there's no one living there. Okay. You don't, I think you remember. There's, um, there's a place at Honeymoon Bay where um, there's someone most of the year sort of living there. Uh, it and takes their own caravans or I don't know how Americans call it trailers. Uh, yeah, caravans we call them. Yeah, you can. That's part part of their path when they go to the Kimberleys. They stop there, but even them, they said the the roads to get there is really rough. Okay, so it's it's not an easy place to get to for anybody. No, the, no, there's no. no there's no real roads. No. I mean, there's some really bad quality corrugated roads. Um, yeah, it's um. There's nothing there. Basically, there's nothing there. So you you had to eventually uh, sail to your rescue because you couldn't signal for rescue. Do you guys did you guys have an EPIRB or you just didn't want to use it because you wanted to salvage part of the boat or? Well, um, first if... it, this is a bit. I've been criticised in this decision too. Well, look, I'm mean, I'm stupid fool. I put myself in this situation. Um, I should get myself out of it. That's primarily the way okay. I think. We had the first, we had two eaters, okay. so we were fine. Right. Um, yes, the eater is involved, and yes, I have the consideration to look after her, but I felt fine. You weren't and thinking at my, the time. My reading of the rules is we weren't imminently in danger of life or vessel. The vessel already had been damaged, damaged it was floating. but it was floating. There was no... Tempest, there was no storm. It was, it was nice weather. It was still one month until the cyclones hit that region. So we're good. We had water. We had well, more than a month. But food. We had water, food. So in we're my reading of it, it's, I shouldn't really flick the ether um, because we're not in imminent danger. Yeah, but I believe the main thing is once you pull the ether and they come in rescue, especially in that location, probably they will come in a helicopter. They take you. You cannot take any of your belongings. So once they come in, pick this. We've lost everything. At that moment, we abandon everything. So the first boat that comes by, they can take everything from there. They can claim the boat for them. But um, we also, I had the idea that I could try and do some repairs. Yeah, beach the boat. Beach the boat. We wanted to get it in behind this little island. There was this um, um, a little beach, and I could um, somehow plug it all up. Um, we the tried then. The, the trouble, yeah, we tried to get into the bay. We got close to the bay. We sailed a bit. And we sailed a bit with, with the boat full of water. Yeah, with the Jenny curve. We were doing our But we had no runners, so tender. it was so difficult. Um, but 
the damage was, it was unbelievable. There's so much damage. I mean, how the hell would you sail that without any steering whatsoever in these massive holes? I could plug up maybe 30% of the holes or 40% of the holes. It's just too... So what were you able to salvage off the boat uh, when you eventually uh, found people? Very little, very little. Uh, we actually, we didn't return to the boat. Um, we, you can't actually, it's, it's it's such a remote location. I think it would have cost us five grand to fly in. Just to see where it was. To see where the boat was. <laughs> okay. And the plane could take 300 kilos back, right. including weight and margarita's weight um and five thousand dollars um i didn't think we didn't have five thousand dollars anyway and then we asked uh, for folks to get a barge or something to oh, come yeah. and pick mongrel right. but because it's so remote it's 300 and almost 400 miles out of civilization where someone could pick us well bring the boat back the cost of picking the boat and fixing well, the boats it wasn't a reach the value of the boat well, it wasn't so, a consideration because we couldn't have funded it anyway and then was, you have a boat that it's not seaworthy anymore because it's full of patches yeah, yeah but, but the prime thing was we didn't have the funds to get to the boat anyway let alone get a barge that could lift it up right yeah yeah but at the time you don't you, you think the money but you don't think too much well think it, it was more an emotional decision for Peter. It took him a while to, I need to bring my boat back. But then he, he got to the conclusion that we couldn't bring the boat back. And you, you guys did not have insurance? No. Uh, so how did, uh, how did, go it, ahead. He was. Insurance. Um, it wouldn't have covered that area anyway. I had insurance up to the year before, but as a lot of boat owners know, if yours is not a production boat, uh, the premium's like three or four times the actual premium for an ordinary 42-foot catamaran. It's ridiculous. Even though my boat had Kevlar inners, and it was very strong boat, and in my opinion, better uh, better constructed than a production boat. The my insurance was three or four times, and I could afford it in the first couple of years when I went cruising, but I, I couldn't afford it uh, in that last year. And they wouldn't have covered it anyway because they have a, a a new Northern Australian rule that if it's in a certain area, they just don't cover it. Yeah, I think I think you find is that the further afield you go, the harder it is to get insurance and keep insurance. And they always there's always like some sort of inspection that needs to be done and some sort of uh, surveyor of some type, which are usually in short supply in remote areas. Yeah, not that it doesn't matter. I mean, there was nothing. The boat was a okay with respect to survey. Yeah, every five years you get a surveyor on and. He writes his little note and he'll say, oh, you got to change this and this and this. But I'd already had that done. That was all good. There was nothing wrong with the boat. Um, that's not, that wasn't the obstacle. The obstacle is the huge premiums that they charge for non-production boats. Because people go, oh, why don't you have insurance? Because, for example, a lagoon, um, I think it was mine was three and a half times Um the um, premium of a lagoon, and the lagoon was um, one and a half times the market value of my boat. How old was your boat when? 15, 15 years old. Okay, 15 so years old. not super new, but not super old. That's usually you can get insurance for both that old. Uh, but I understand that it, the premiums can be quite expensive and hard to get in remote areas. It sounds like you were in remote areas. Uh, so the, when you finally got rescued or you finally found somebody to take you out of the Kimberleys, when was that? How did that happen? Well, that, that sort of, um, that happened really quite quickly. Yeah. There was a, um, 
a cruise, uh, a small cruise liner for old people. Did I say that? No, I shouldn't say um, that. <laughs> since this region is really remote, just when you get to a certain age in your life, it's when you can afford some type of trips. And this is one of the trips, really fancy luxury, luxuries cruise liners do that coastline. Okay. And this so we got, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I saw lights and I got onto the radio, the VHF, and I sent up a couple of flares and they spotted us and um, they picked us up um, two days later. So we were very fortunate because we were actually at the end of the Kimberley's cruising uh, season. Most people had already gone south or had gone back to Darwin. Um, there was still plenty of time uh, for avoidance of hurricanes and cyclones but usually people are out of that area by the time we're there um and so we're very fortunate that they picked us up and um, they treated us very well and um it could be a day before because we were trying the day before we were sailing really slowly the boat peter had the tender using as the the rudder the steering and i was holding then the jenniker and then he would come when the strong would get stronger the Jennifer, so we can slowly turn and go into the bay. So we we were trying to beach the boat, but in this bay, so on the, on the, the and if we had got there, winds. if we had got there that day, we wouldn't have seen that cruise liner because at all. Because it was like because it would have been blocked from our view. The bay yeah. would be blocked, so we wouldn't see any sea from the coast. Yeah. They wouldn't see us. They wouldn't have seen and us. Those we were the seen. only people you saw prior. To them picking you up, you didn't see any other boats. You didn't see any other people after the, saw, the wreck. Well, I saw a sailboat about a week or two before, probably about a hundred and fifty miles north, and they were heading north. So I saw one boat. Um, yeah, about a week or two before. Yeah, but they—I knew they were heading north. I knew they weren't going south. And and. You tried them on the VHF, and they didn't. There's no, no, we knew they were going north. They're 150 mile away. There's no VHF that's going to reach that. It's too far so away. There's, there's no point. How were you able? To, you saw them on AIS, or what did you? How did that? How were you able to see somebody 150 miles away? We we just cruised past them. You cruised past them. Yeah. Yeah. And now heading north. Oh, but that was before the boat was wrecked, or after. It was, uh, it was like a week before. It was a week, a week before. before. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, so there's no way. You, yeah. Okay, makes sense. So, so after the wreck, how long was it before you saw the cruise ship? Two days. Two days. Okay. All right. So it wasn't it wasn't a super long time. And by that time, you had been beached, or were you still floating? We, we didn't quite get it in uh, in around uh, the next days. Um, if we didn't get rescued that next day, I was going to leapfrog anchors uh-huh. and get it closer and closer to the beach and then put it on the sandbank. The trouble is also with all of this is this crocodiles around, so it's difficult to do all of this maneuvering because uh, usually I'm in the water when I'm leapfrogging anchors. Uh, it's, not, it's just much easier. Um, but anyway, that was the next day's exercise, but we got picked up early that morning or we saw them so we saw them at 2 a.m it was the accident was two days we've been sleeping for two days on the top of the boat and i fell asleep i was super tired but peter couldn't sleep and at the horizon 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 he saw a light and he realized it was the bad so then he rushed to wake me up he connected the batteries to the radio we shook the flares and then they finally our call and then again it was a bit difficult for them to find us because we didn't have any because we didn't have batteries on our phones or the tablets and the sharp letter was off to get our location and also the it first was a bit difficult to give them an exact point where we were yeah and also yeah because we had all our electronics was gone and also he was going to anchor where that uncharted rock was so I had to try and, because I, 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 I had, uh, we had the uh, tablet. I had to direct him around to so go around the other side. Otherwise, he would have possibly hit that. 
and that's he, his draft is eight meters. Yeah, so, they were big. well, he would have hit it at any time. And then after we made contact and organized it, they were really nice. They said, "Do you mind if we pick you if we pick you in the morning? Because we don't want to hit any rocks." He said, "Don't you worry. Come in the morning. You know where we are. Just come and pick us tomorrow." All right. So after you got on the boat and you got back to um, civilization, how long was it before you started looking for a new boat? Oh, it, well, I was a bit of a mess. Uh, I still am not fully recovered. Doing the videos for people that are interested uh, kills me every time. It kills me. Uh, I don't know if people can appreciate that because. Um, I really put a lot of effort and heart and soul in Long Reef. Uh, I didn't really, I look, suffice to say I was a mess and the topic of anything beyond Long Reef was beyond me. Uh, um, I tried to just get into fitness and try and sidetrack myself. Um, Margarita was there, I don't know how she was there. I must have been terrible to be with. Yeah, so the, the topic of a new boat wasn't there for a long time, I think. But the thought of getting back to the ocean was always present for Peter mm. because that's, he was always thinking, I need to get back to the ocean. That's the only way I'm going to recover. If I stay stuck here in civilization, I'm going to die. I need to get back to the ocean where I'm free and I can spear fish and do back to selling and then after um, started looking back. Um, maybe what six months maybe six Seven months, months eight months later we started looking at boats again also the fun situation precluded um Looking at if if I was a pure robot and I went oh I lost long reef I need a new boat well it just wasn't possible at that time anyway so we we needed some time to build up funds Margarita was the funds gatherer uh, I was the person that did a lot of this and I did a lot of this. no that's not true. Margarita got paid better than me so anyway now and we had the big friend of Peter that oh, yeah. helped and us. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. That's right. We got then some money from a friend of mine that I met on an island, incidentally. Uh, okay, so how did you settle on Freedom? What kind of boat is Freedom? And how did you get interested in this boat that was in Florida? Uh, well, if we're going to buy a new boat, a new old boat, <laughs> it would be better to buy it. I always want to do the South Pacific, so it'd be better to buy it on the right side of the Pacific because it's easier to sail one way than the other. Yeah. So it had to be Caribbean or the US or the Americas, somewhere in there. Uh, the other situation was basically dictated by costs, and the second consideration was costs, and the third consideration was costs. Uh, basically, this boat is a big compromise on what... Uh, I want a normal person, if someone had a lot of money and they wanted to go on a, a, an extended cruise, they would probably not buy this boat. Yeah, because it's a 42, but it's it's, a, it's, it's, it's really narrow, it's a so 35 it's really foot, small. It's a 35 foot 42, 41 and a foot boat. It's very little space. Yeah. It's very narrow. Um, the two things that I... We're getting used to it. We're going to get yeah. there. Yeah, it's, 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 it's got a lot of teething problems. The, the reason why I settled on this boat was it had a good motor, uh, low hours, although we did have problems with the motor in the first yeah. run. Uh, we had a lot of bad luck uh, in that respect. We had water that came through the, um, the airlock box. For some b bizarre reason, it got into the motor. And we've done the calculation. Everything's right. But we had problems there. 
the other thing was the hull was strong and there was no keel bolts and it was an encapsulated keel. Yeah. So basically, oh, and I didn't want to catch. Uh, I would have preferred, I got a propeller rig, which is what I wanted. So really, that's the criteria yeah, we but had. Yeah, like now I research it with getting an encapsulated keel and that was difficult to get at the range of price that we could have afforded. Yeah. And this was so, one of them. So for, it's really strong. It's super thick. Yeah. To, to explain to people, um, an encapsulated keel, if it's done properly, and I could go into for an hour explaining how this is a real bizarre boat. This is not a typical encapsulated keel boat. I've got uh, an aversion to keel bolts, and especially in the price range we were looking at, the keel bolts are going to be 30 years old. 35 years old, a lot of them you can't even get to, and most people go, oh, it's all right, out of sight, out of mind. I just don't like that situation. Yeah, because it's the kill go. Yeah, it's just... go bound, it's, right? it's catastrophic failure. Yeah. I wanted to keep away from that. Um, so it had to be encapsulated keel, and had to have, had to have a good motor, and had to, be, had, had to be strong. And so that's what we got. Uh, there are lots of other compromises, but... We can work on them. With we'll time. work on it. Yeah. So, did you? You said you did not want to catch, or this is a catch. No, I, well, I, I didn't want to catch. You didn't want one. I, okay. Yeah, I didn't want it. Uh, number one, I'm not a very good sailor, and with two sails, well, Too you much. know, it's all confusing. Yeah. Uh, so, well, is look, it a I've sloop heard... or is it a cutter? How, how's it rigged? It's a cutter rig. I think it's easier to balance than a catch, um, a cutter rigs. Yeah, so that's, that's basically what I wanted. Yeah, so I mean, you know, one of the issues that we've had with the, the downwind sailing is it's a real pain to downwind sail with the main, and uh, we're thinking of putting on a, a inner force day on our boat, which is typically does have an inner, inner force day, uh, just because it's easier to go downwind with Are two head gonna... sails. Wing yeah. and wing, yeah. Uh, so that yeah, I think that's a good choice for the if you're going to do the milk run. Um, what uh, what other things are on this boat? Do you have were you did you have to upgrade the solar panels? Did you put on a wind generator? Well, it was it, it didn't have any solar panels. Yeah. We had to put solar panels. Uh, it had a wind generator. It didn't work. Yeah. It had an autopilot. It didn't work. It's still got the radar. It doesn't work. Yeah, the radar, we... Uh, what else doesn't someone work? Someone will fix it for us. It had a... The wind generator, we had a friend that thinks that knows what's the problem, so we're going to try and fix ourselves. We got a David system that our really good friend, Tim, Tim, Tim did it for us. We had a windlass. That didn't work. I did a whole, ep I did a whole episode on it. How I bought this boat and I went through everything that didn't work, and then everyone came back and said, "So why'd you buy the boat?" Well, hull, encapsulated keel, and motor, yeah. but everything else didn't work. And Bob was our great, great friend that got us the windlass. Yeah, Bob. Thank you, Bob. If Bob's out there watching, uh, I fought with him for a month. He wanted to buy us a windlass. Uh, I don't know sometime in June, and I said, no, nah, Bob, I'm going to fix the old one. No, 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 no. Well, we couldn't fix it. eventually he got the better. Uh, he won the argument. We and he actually bought, he bought us a win. So we're tremendously grateful to Bob for doing that. It was amazing. All right. Uh, and I, I think I saw that episode. Did you, did you pull out the fridge in the end or no? No, no, no. no, no, no. no. The fridge we kept commissioned because... Tim was um, who made the David. Uh, he's a he's a he loves his beer. So he did the crossing with us from Tampa to okay. Mexico. Okay. So it would have been very rude of me to get decommission the fridge if he liked beer. He did so much work on the boat that okay. it, it would not be nice. But then I said to Peter, if by any chance we might end up one day in a marina, I can have my cheese and my yogurt. See, look what's happened. Self-sufficiency has gone down the toilet. <laughs> no, no, it's connected. We've been... Oh, wow. Well. It's, 
sounds like you have good company that is uh, making up for the lack of self-sufficiency. It gets interesting, <laughs> company. If we had 24 hour surveillance, people would go, really? Really? <laughs> All right, so you, you guys got the boat in Tampa. How long were you working on it in Tampa? Three months. Until we had to leave. Yeah, we had to leave. We left the day we had to leave. Okay, yeah. that was like a visa issue? It's like a... Yeah, because we were on the um, waiver program. Half of our countries, we actually don't need a visa if we stay for 90 days in the U.S. Okay. You have to get out in 90 but days. But you have to get out. Well, we got out in 90 days. Yeah. <laughs> was, the boat, was the boat prepared fully? Well, that's debatable. Um... But we did think we had the motor and we had plenty of fuel and we could certainly get there, although we did have dramas. But that's going to be showing in the next week or two okay. what the drama had because, boy, we had some bad luck. We're safe now. We're safe now. There's, there's usually a long lag between when I interview somebody and when the episode comes out, so All right, it then. won't be a spoiler if you say it. But you don't have to say it. You can keep it a secret. Uh, it, the, um, so you, did you sail directly from Tampa to Isla or where, where'd you go? Yeah. It was, it well, should have been straight for max four days. It oh, took right. us eight days and a half. Okay. <laughs> All right. Dry tour The mother kaput. We didn't quite get to the dry tour too, because we sort of headed south. Yeah, we had um, we had no wind. We it was we didn't we left because we had to leave. We looked at the weather. Yes, there were no tropical disturbances. We had a big high in the Gulf of Mexico, so we knew it was going to be light winds. But we skirt around that and perhaps hit ten knot winds. We thought, well, we didn't get that. We ran the motor for two days. Then it died. Um, essentially, I think to any people that have the same issue. If you do have a, um, what are you doing? Good? Just, I'm just, just checking. Just checking. Check. If you do have the um, airlock, you got to make sure the airlock, and ours is all good, but for some reason, when we were trying to start the motor, when we were um, trying to bleed the system, we were wallowing, and we think water got pumped up through into the airlock and the positive pressure actually stopped the siphon because that was actually pushing and it, then it forced it into the motor and then we had more uh, water in the um, cylinders. Oh my goodness. We were unlucky at that time that we just, because uh, there was no wind, it was just glassy, but then it started wallowing in this really swell that exactly matched our pendulum motion. We were drifting for yeah, we were, uh, two days. We, mean, we, I don't know. we were essentially drifting for six days with tiny bits of sailing in yeah. between. And I remember we had almost two days in a row that we didn't have oh. any wind. That's what I'm saying. For oh, two no. days that we stayed, we, we yeah. didn't raise any sail. Oh, yeah. We Not went, even a bit. We went somewhere. We went backwards. Backwards. Back into the Gulf of Mexico. Because of the current, the current was pushing you back into the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, we did. We tried three times to get fast enough, enough below Isla, so we could punch across the Yucatan channels. Yeah, current, the current, the current is huge. Right. Yeah. It's difficult to do that without a motor and having five knots of breeze. Yeah. And our misfortune. Well, we got it on the third attempt. Our HF stopped working too, so we didn't have weather report. We're at the best time to get stuck in the Gulf of Mexico, weather on hurricane season. So we would be hailing to the cargo ships that would be stopping by, so to get any weather forecast, it will be, oh, we hear drifting, but at least there's nothing wrong at the moment. I'm not going to be hit by a cyclone or a hurricane or whatever. Yeah. But Mostly, no one wanted to talk to us. Right. <laughs> That's my experience with ships. Uh, so, so what time of year was this? We got 
this is in um, this is in July. We just got to put um, some power on because oh, we're okay, going to run out. Yeah. This is just in July last. Just need the um, record. So, one of the things that before I left in 2016, I spent some time because I'd read so much about uh, that whole issue of water siphoning up into the engine. I, you know, I put in like a special flapper and a special anti siphon thing just to, to avoid that issue. Uh, how were you able to get it fixed? Well, um, I've never had that problem before, so um, we couldn't fix it on the boat. Um, now I know I could have fixed it on the boat. Uh, I was just a bit reluctant to um, start poking around and doing things that I just didn't know uh, what I was doing. Same with Tim. He was on the boat. He didn't know anything about that either. So to fix it, basically, uh, you just rip out all the injectors because um, we had water in one of them and some water in the others and we just turn it over and you just blow all the water out and then you uh, well this is what we did maybe there's once, a better way of doing it. this was once we uh, arrived to Isla oh yeah once yeah. we got to Isla yeah. um, we went to a marina because we couldn't just anchor in Isla because in Isla's got such poor holding for the seagrass we had to go to Marina, and um, yeah, so we blew out, took out all the injectors, blew out all the um, water, which is really quite easy. Uh, put it all back in, rebled the system, and it, it, it started, just started. Working. It started working. Wow, that's great! So, I didn't think it was such an easy fix. Well, Peter suspects there's something still more in the motor, uh -huh. so we need like a big checkup before we do the South Pacific crossing. Because we don't want to have... I'm taking apart um, the motor. Oh. Um, has it, has it I... been dying or not really? I would think if it wasn't dying, it... No, it, it, no. it died once more. Yeah. But we think it's because the diesel tank is not as clean as we thought. We yeah. cleaned the diesel tank, but must be something inside more there. Some joker um, did some silicon work in the tank. Right. And... Locked, so there's flaps of silicon. Yeah. Okay. In fact, the lamp died. A flap of silicon just went over the um, the fuel intake because pipe. Because we thought it was lack of yeah. fuel, but it wasn't. It, it was wasn't. full. It was half, well more than half full. So we think that the motor's all good. I'm going to do, redo the fuel tank, clean that out, and make sure. That, I mean, I thought I did a really good job. That's the only thing I could think of. Yeah. Uh, there is a blackened injector in motor and i gotta work out what's wrong with that so yeah. you know i'd say that on on most of my long passages i've had engine problems right and i spent a lot of time and, and money keeping up my engine uh and, and i think a lot of the issues is possibly if you have a dirty fuel tank uh but also you know you just when you're on passage i think you get more wave action a lot of more bubbles into the system yeah. that you know, when you're going up and down there's more air coming in uh, and also possibly dirt, but I think it's more likely it's kind of air bubbles. So I mean, I think it's, I think it's common on in rough water to have engine problems. Oh yeah, because yeah, it stirs up all the filth in the bottom. Right. So I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's. I don't. I think it's kind of impossible to get rid of all of it. But uh, certainly, have, cleaning out your fuel tank is is a is a good thing to do if you're willing yeah, to do it. Get it. I can't. I, the only explanation is there must have been something I missed because it, it's clean. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. There's a, there's always like any error in the system somewhere, which is kind of like a problem that has no solution, right? Because there could be any place that you have air ingress into the system. How do you get rid of the air that is in the system? What? How do you, how do you get rid of the air in the system? You bleed it. You bleed yeah. the, the engine. And and it's, it's the same process. Yeah, yeah it was. It, it's um, you typically would bleed not at the injectors, but bleed at a bleed screw. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, we we do all of that. Um, I'm just um, if you do get 
bit of air getting, you know, your tank's going back and forth, you get a bit of air going up. That shouldn't be enough to kill your engine because your primary filter and your secondary filter certainly got enough reservoir to overcome that. And if it goes up into your, from my understanding, it goes up in your high pressure pump, well, it shouldn't actually go up into your high pressure pump. I, I, look, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. But. I think if there's any if there's any place along the system that you have ingress of air, then you're going to have oh, yeah, that- you're going to have air problems, right? And it's probably going to be worse the rougher the seas. That would be my bet, my guess. Um, okay, so you guys got to Islam. How'd you get into the marina? Did you sail into the marina? No, uh, no, no. We, we, got a t- we got a tow. We got towed by Jorge. And it's Explain the story. Navagancia. So um, we crossed that big current, the Yucatan Channel current, yeah. and Immediately after we crossing. Can I, can I just interject here? Yeah. So this is our third time trying to cross this five knot current, right? I've gone, so we've been thrown into the Gulf of Mexico twice because we've had five, six knots of breeze. That's not enough to punch into anything. So this is our third time. I went down quite south and we came across Banco Aerosmith where we actually got into a counter current that actually sent us south, which was really bizarre. And I actually was lulled into thinking that I had actually crossed the bulk of the current or we'd missed the current. But some people have apparently done the crossing and have never got the five knots. So I thought, oh, hello, Lulu, this is happening. But anyway, we got 12 knots of breeze at this time. And I'm thinking, great, we're gonna, we might be able to do this. But then we got hit in this current and I had the wind up our bum. We had uh, the head till, um, the main jib pulled out. We had the main out, wing on wing. We were at 180 degrees. The wind was right up our bum. And on the chart father, we were doing circles. So we were going just a little bit forward, a little bit back. We were doing nothing. <laughs> I reversed it and I put the pole out on the other side through the man on the other side and the wind was also at 180 degrees but we started making headway at 0.2 knots <laughs> this is crazy we were going north northwest so we're getting thrown back into the the gulf of mexico again but at least we we're going a little bit west and we were going up this slope and i saw this really steep section this is about 20 mile north north east or northeast of isla was this very precipitous drop on the chart plotter. And I just wanted to avoid that at all costs. I could see that if we went there, there would just be a major current. And then there was this gradual slope before that, and we were heading up that. And this precipitous drop was just another couple of miles over. I'm going, oh, we're going to be in trouble again. And we were just lucky that there was this underground hill, but when we just went past it, it created an eddy and it threw us up onto the 180 foot mark, the depth, where the current is supposed to only be one knot north. We actually had no current. We were sitting dead and then the wind promptly died. And so we're sitting, this precipitous drop is literally within a mile of us. And we had the gradual land breeze then came in, starting to push us back out. So we then got the ducky out and we, and, and we started motoring trying to push the boat closer and closer to Isla. So you are motoring the boat with the dinghy? We had to. Because yeah, if yeah. we got to that, I just knew there was this bad current there. And uh, Margarita got on the radio. Now it's your turn. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. Now we were able to cross that each current. And while they were working outside, I was hailing to anyone that could hear me. We need you to tell us. Otherwise, we're screwed. We're going to go back to the Gulf of Mexico and we're going to be thrown to Texas. And I was doing this for, I don't know, almost an hour. And they would ask my location. I'll give them the coordinates. And then automatically, I'll have no return. And I had three people that have done this. And I asked their boat name so I knew who I was talking. No one told me anything. And after a while, Jorge was listening to all of this. And he came and he said, I'm going to help you. I'm coming from Cuba. I'm heading your, your way. 
away in an hour. I'll be picking you up and I'll be helping you. And that's what happened. For one hour more, Peter and Tim, Tim was on the decky. Start so we wouldn't be drifting backwards. So we stay in the same position so Jorge could pick us. And then we would be towed for three hours until we got to Isla Mujeres. We dropped anchor. And the next day, uh, the marina guys came and picked our boat and towed us inside the marina. Okay. That's a that's so many things that happened to me before. <laughs> yeah. Not so much current, but <laughs> I've been towed into the marina before. Last, last, last half day. Yeah. Now, may we say that Jorge is a gentleman's gentleman, yeah. and he did everything in his power to help to us. Help and us. he us uh, from half and half an hour, 15, 15 minutes, he'll be coming on, hailing on the right, he's still... We are, on, we are on our way. We still have more X miles to do. So we knew he didn't run away and he didn't forget it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's that's great. And you guys are in uh, the Rio Dulce for the hurricane right. season now? Okay. Yeah. Well, that sounds awesome. Uh, I'll, I won't take any more of your time. I think we're well over an hour now on the clock. So... It was nice talking uh, to you guys. Uh, is there anything that I should have asked you, but I didn't ask you? I don't know. I'm amazed you got an hour out of us. I reckon I'm only interested. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I reckon I'm only interested, uh, interesting for six or eight minutes. That's why my blogs only go for six to eight. <laughs> no, no, no. You're interesting for hours, but uh, I don't want to keep you all day. So, uh, uh, is, is there anything you want uh, people to know? Uh, any any uh how should people find you well they want to hear more about your story well they can just visit the blog really um i'm not i'm not the greatest blogger i i'm not the greatest promoter so that sort of thing it is not a fan is, of is, the internet is is difficult for me so i'm not sure maybe it's more the I'm not going to tell you a, a, a mug of coffee with my face on it or a T-shirt. Uh, well, it's, yeah, promotion is not my thing. Oh, so the Sailing Into Freedom T-shirts are not yet available. Not yet not available. Yet available. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to order one as soon as they come out. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for talking to me. Have a good trip, and hopefully uh, we'll see you on the water at some point. Thank you for having it. Good on you, Linus. Thank you for interviewing it. Good on you.